Well, I can remember the feeling when Lauren and I first brought home our eight-week-old Basenji puppy, not baby, you thought I was going to say baby, Basenji puppy named Hudson, and uh, he was so cute, he was so curious, he was so full of life, how could we not love everything about him? We had just gotten to Dallas, and uh, it was like two weeks into our time there, and Lauren just said, we're getting a dog, I can't take it, so we drove out, picked up a dog, brought him back. And um, four weeks and, and for months, that feeling was unabated. He's just this wonderful little dog. He's running around doing everything you hope. You, know, you don't have any kids at, at this point, so he's getting all that attention. Every night, we would play with our puppy on the living room floor. We would feed him. We would bring him treats every single day. I don't know what I spent those months on treats, just constant. But we loved to take him to our dog park. He got all of our attention. He was the apple of our eye. And we love our pets, right? Those of you who have dogs or you have cats, you know the warmth of which I'm speaking. But, 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 for those of you who have pets, you know that there is an alternate side of the story. There is a complexity to having an animal in, in your life, and you, you've experienced that complexity. You know that there must be more to my experience with Hudson as well, and there is. A few years into our time at Dallas, so he's no longer that fresh, Lauren and I returned one night to our apartment to find that Hudson had been an incredibly bad dog, very bad, the worst he had ever been. And I remember the anger and the shock that welled up within me when I discovered what he had done. It was like walking into a crime scene, right? You know, as soon as you crack the door, you just feel something is amiss. What are we walking into, right? Something's not where it's supposed to be. And we had an apartment that kind of weaved its way through. So it was truly like a, it was like a crime expose as we walked into the apartment. Well, we walked into our bedroom only to find that Hudson was sleeping in our bed, which was a no-no. But he was not only sleeping in our bed, he was covered in black ink in our bed, which had a white comforter, no longer white. And he was sleeping not only in our bed covered in black ink, but he was in a pile of trash that he had brought into our bed from the trash can, which he had knocked over and torn to bits, taking like a whole chicken out and carrying it into our, into our bed. It's a terrible dog. And not only this was he sitting in, in this pile of trash in our bed covered in black ink, he had chewed through and swallowed several pens. They were in his body at that moment. There was trash wrappers that contained bits of broken plastic from all manner of items that he had deemed necessary to steal and to chew. We even believe that he stole a tube of medicated hand cream, like prescription hand cream, and ingested it whole. But we don't have any proof of this. We never found it. He just got suddenly sick. And you would think that this terror would be enough, right? That scene that I've just described for you. But no, this dog was not done. When we went into our closet, we saw that Hudson had torn out all of the leather shoes to bits, and he had surgically removed the tongues from all the shoes and ingested all of the leather shoelaces. So he had destroyed, like, pretty much all of our quality shoes, both mine and Lauren's. It was unbelievable. Our puppy, our sweet boy Hudson, had descended into an unexplainable madness. And he had become a monster, and he had broken every rule that we ever set. And we love our dog, Hudson, but he had made a mess of things on that day. And now, you know, there was a result, right? Sanctions were immediately applied. Changes were made to his freedoms at the structural level. The future was going to look very different for Hudson. Our love did not change for him, but his circumstances going forward, even to this very day, are changed forever because of the way he acted. The circumstances had to change. Now, the next verses in Genesis 6, 1 to 8, they are some of the hardest to interpret in all the Bible, these next eight verses. But I believe that they speak about an episode between mankind and God that is not unlike the vignette that I have just given you about my dog and me. 
all of the same pieces are there. Each of us knows something of what it's like to have been in my shoes discovering Hudson. Each of us can think of a time that we played the monster, that we were in his spot, right? And we had to go through a time of consequence and judgment with God as a result. Well, this morning, we're going to see a vision of God's heart grieved, and it's grieved over real sin. Furthermore, we will see the way in which God's judgment and grace are both worked out on the pages of history. So it's not simply a response of judgment, but also one of grace. So first, we will see the specific way in which moral degradation, moral degradation takes place and takes hold in a society. Then we're going to see the dual response, the double response from God, divine grief on the one hand and yet divine grace on the other. And finally, we'll let these lessons sink in as we consider how we ourselves might hold on to holiness of heart. We're going to listen for the thrust of this text and and allow it to lead us into holding on to our own holiness of heart. Genesis 6, 1 to 8. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, where the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him to His heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Well, as I said, this is one of the more difficult passages, if not the most historically difficult passage to interpret in the Old Testament. I gave myself two weeks on this one intentionally uh, to make some decisions that you'll hear as I work, work through it. And the passage is one that, that can be confounding for several different reasons. Maybe you had questions even upon your first reading. And I'll get to a few of those uh, issues in due course, but before I do, what I want to do instead is, is show you not that the, the parts of this passage that are simpler to understand. If we're going to work our way toward the harder things, it's good Bible study to work from the things we do understand, from the stuff we really can see in the text that is clear. And so what are we dealing with overall? What exactly are we dealing with in the first movement of this passage? In your Bible, you might see that you've got this broken up into two little paragraphs. Let's look at that first one. What's the bigger point right here? Well, the first five verses, they give us a picture that might be a little bit grainy, but you can make out the contour of what's happening. You can make out the image. You can see that the first five verses are all about moral degradation or moral degeneration. And as we'll see in the coming drama of the flood, all the world is sliding now further and further into a protracted wickedness, into a state of wickedness that the Lord must ultimately pass judgment on. But by now, we know one of the means of communication in the text of Genesis is repetition, right? We know that that's how uh, Moses is, is communicating things literarily, through repetition, and even through patterning. You see that again right here. A prime example of this repetition and this patterning is right there in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6. In this case, the pattern on display is one that Moses wants us to catch, and I'm going to call it the pattern 
of sin. It's the pattern of sin. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took any that they chose. They see, they reckon good, and they take any that they choose. That's the pattern of sin. Does it seem familiar? See plus good plus take. It should be familiar to us by this point. After all, this is the pattern that Adam and Eve and their sinful eating of the fruit enact in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. So, there's a, a calling back to that pattern, a repeating of it so that you can pay attention to it. I'll read that for you. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, what does she do? She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So, the pattern of sin is being described again and again in Genesis. It's picking up steam. As readers, we are being keyed in to the way in which our vulnerabilities are exploited by the evil one. Moses is trying to help you to see, in the leading of the Spirit, we believe, that this is the way that the pattern of sin works. Because here is really what's going on underneath it. Here's what's happening. We have eyes, spiritual eyes, that are meant to behold God's glory. It's what we're meant to be looking at, really. He's the one who should be holding our gaze. And yet, what happens is we lower our gaze and we stare at lesser lights, things that are reflective in some way of His glory or have have a creaturely glory, but we stare at these lesser lights. And having looked at these created things, we are then drawn to them, usually because of their goodness in some way, but often despite God's law or against or contra the way that God wants us to relate to those given objects within creation. That's what ends up happening. And finally, what we do is once we've dropped our gaze away from the one we're supposed to be truly worshiping, truly looking at with the eyes of our heart, we begin to fixate on creatures and on creaturely things, and we look at their goodness, we then act out and we take them for reasons all our own. We don't consult with God and say, what are your reasons? What is your world? What is your order? How am I to relate to the things horizontally? We go, no, I like that. I want that. I'm taking that for reasons all my own. And that is the pattern of sin. That's the danger that I'm living with every day. Maybe it's the danger that you are living with every day. If you were to just reduce it to those key movements, you would find that this is the drama that plays out. You are familiar with the pattern of sin that's presented in the Bible here and and elsewhere, but maybe you've heard the famous poem by William Carlos Williams that gets at this pattern uh, so well. This is a really kind of an interesting short little poem. It's called, This Is Just to Say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious, so sweet, and so cold. (laughs) End of poem, right? It's a famous poem because it gets at just the strangeness of the fact that you know you shouldn't do something. You're tempted to do it. You do it. You even say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done it. And then all you can do is revel in the fact that they were so sweet and so cold. Augustine will, will say something similar when he talks about the fact that he realized that he was a sinner by nature because he would go do things that were wrong just because they were wrong, just because he was attracted to the idea that he couldn't have something, he would take it. This is how he comes to an awareness of himself and discovers his need for God. The pattern of sin is visible. Uh, both inside and outside the Bible. It's visible in the pattern of our own lives. The pattern of sin is pressing in around us at all times, and it has these same contours again and again. 
our gaze drops from heaven to earthly things, and then our hearts desire the goodness of those things in and of themselves more than the goodness of God or in a way that God does not intend. And it's at that moment that instead of stopping and reconsidering, we choose to reach out with nothing more than our own desire, nothing more than our own entitlement, and we take. And this is what it is to sin. The pattern of sin is is one that we're seeing in the moral degradation of this passage, but there's more that, that we want to see. The pattern of sin, repeated again and again, it leads somewhere. It leads to the pollution of sin in the land. This is a category that the Bible wants us to see. There's a cumulative effect, not just individuals before God, but whole societies. To understand that cumulative pollution of sin, we need to get a little bit more information about this passage and what it's saying really went on. I'll try to do that for you here. Now, as you're reading this passage, you might wonder, what in the heck is happening? Who is marrying who here? What's all this about sons of God, uh, daughters of men, Nephilim, men of renown? What are these characters, right? How are they interacting? What do they mean? Well, that's why this is the most complex interpretive challenge in the Old Testament. This verse has twisted interpreters into pretzels for a thousand years. We're not going to solve it perfectly this morning, but after a couple weeks, I'm going to give you my considered view as to what I think is happening here. I believe that this language of sons of God and daughters of men that you're seeing right up front is a phrase that's important in how you read the passage. Some have posited that the sons of God were angels who had forbidden sex with human women and then, as a result, produced angel-human hybrids who wreaked dark havoc upon the earth. Maybe, maybe you've heard this interpretation before. After a couple weeks of looking at this, and for a whole host of metaphysical reasons related to embodiment, related to human sexuality, related to the spiritual nature of angels, in my opinion, this view does not not hold up. I don't think it really works for a whole host of reasons, but many, just, just the metaphysics of it. But here's what I think is going on. I believe that the immediate context in chapter 4 and in chapter 5, which we've been working our way through, with that emphasis on genealogy that we've been looking at. Remember the worshiping line of Seth and the worldly line of Cain? I think that is kind of key to what's happening in this moment. I believe that this passage is about Sethites. Remember those people who are functioning as God's people at this point? Them intermarrying with women from outside that line of Seth, those who were not worshipers of God. You see an intermarrying that's going on. You know later in Deuteronomy, there's material that establishes the need to reject intermarriage between people groups, and you have to ask why. Why does that happen? Because the concern is about inviting idolatry into God's community. That is a major concern in the ancient Near East. It's a major concern of Israel. And yet, these sons of God I believe the worshiping community, they have followed the pattern of sin, and they have taken wives that were likely forbidden for them to take. The the emphasis in the text is that they took any they chose, right? Not ones designated for them, but any they chose on the basis of their attractiveness. Now, the emphasis seems to be on that self-determined freedom to reject some standard, of marriage and to take any woman that they wanted, regardless of what God might have said about it. Now, this interpretation, it fits with the pattern of sin that you've just read about, and the result is a decisive move of God's people towards something as serious as idolatry. Because you also have to answer, why is it that God looks at this and says this is going to warrant something like the flood? So, this must be a pretty serious offense. That's why I think idolatry is the subtext of what's happening. But that isn't all. The Nephilim, the men of renown, who are these people? They're mentioned as well. Well, this is, this is pretty interesting. Most ancient Near Eastern scholars agree that this is some reference to two categories of people that have to do with a mythic class, 
class, a mythic class, of especially violent warriors, incredibly violent people. And again, that would fit with the trajectory of the line of Cain, right? So we know that Cain is this person of incredible violence, of braggadocious violence. And you can see that there would be an, a reason to understand that these two groups were people who had built up their renown based on their conquering tribal violence. They would have spilled much blood, and that blood would have soaked the ground and cried out to Yahweh above. Remember, that's a theme as well, the, the, the blood of Abel that cries out. And so when you take these two things and you put them together, the idolatry of God's people along with the presence of, of deep violence within the human community, those two things together demonstrate wide-scale pollution of sin in the earth at this time. I believe this is what God is looking down at and responding to. And this pattern of sin and this pollution of sin, we finally see that this moral degradation is described in verse 5 along the lines of, of something that I'm going to call perdition as the outcome, perdition. Perdition is an old word in Christian theology, and it speaks of damnation or final judgment. Uh, verse 5 shows in graphic detail what the earth looked like from God's vantage point. Look at the emphasis in God's language here. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I mean, what a sentence. And I think that this is what we have to take from it. A culture can arrive at this point. It is possible. It has happened before. The world can get here. The pattern and the pollution of sin can become so entrenched within the hearts of mankind, within the community of mankind, that this description can apply. And as Christians, we must recognize the pattern and the pollution of sin, even in our own world. God in His grace has given us Scripture and the testimony of our conscience and the illumination and guidance of His Spirit to clue us in on the dangers of idolatry, to clue us in on the dangers of our own um, involvement in violence still lurking in the far reaches of our own hearts. And this pattern of and this pattern and pollution of sin, they do lead ultimately to a place. They lead to a place of final judgment, of perdition. Individual and corporate sinfulness cannot go on forever. But the text indicates they raise this offensive odor before a holy God. God who cannot allow the rot to continue unaddressed. He simply cannot allow it. And you have to ask, and what then? What then? Well, the text tells us that God's response is dual. Two things happen. That His response is one of both grief on the one hand and yet a note of grace. Genesis 6, 6 and 7 the Lord regretted that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him to His heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. I mean, wow, do you ever expect to hear language like this from God? Isn't this dramatic? Isn't this unexpected? I think it's meant to catch our attention. God looks down at the mess of this world, the idolatry and the violence mixed together, and His heart is grieved deeply. And I, I don't know about you, but I've been catching these, these constant updates um, about Ukraine and the hostilities and the violence coming out of this, this area, and I am grieved. I was at a coffee shop yesterday. I had a, a, like two hours off, and my mom was kind enough to watch Ezra, so I zipped up to a coffee shop, and I was anticipating, you know, an exciting time with my book. And uh, as soon as I have my coffee, I turn to my right, and it was a friend of mine from, I hadn't seen in 10 years, a Ukrainian friend, and he's pushing a brand new baby, you know, rocking a brand new baby. I said, Mikhail, he said, Dan, uh, he's, you know, pushing his baby back and forth. He said, do you know what's happening in my country? Do you know what's happening? I said, I do. And we just looked at each other. 
And there wasn't much to say. There was not much to say. All we could do was look at one another, embrace one another, offered a prayer, asked about his family. But there wasn't anything to do but grieve. There really wasn't in that moment as we stood in that coffee shop, man to man, countryman to countryman, human to human. And I think that what the text wants us to see is that that experience, that stuckness that we feel, that deep anxiety about the brokenness of the world, God shares it. God shares it. God doesn't blow past it. He's not impervious to it. He is grieved by the violence and the pollution and the pattern of sin in the world. And if you've experienced it in your life, know that God experiences it too. And I think that that can be good news because God is in a position to act. But that's just one country. Think of the whole globe soaked in blood, ruled by the forces of villainous roaming thugs, right? That's the picture that we're getting. And you've got to ask yourself this. We're coming out of Genesis 1 and 2. Is this shalom? Is this, is this the world that God had intended to bring into existence? Is this the garden that we were handed? Or is this a jungle that's gone out of control? Not only does God's heart grieve and hurt at the pollution of sin, but this means that He will judge that sin. Verse 7, the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. Man, animals, creeping things, birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. The idea here in this language is that the purpose of God's creation has gone wildly off track. He can't allow it to get any more off track. So God is not only Father, God is not only Creator, but He is also the supreme judge of the world. There's nobody else fit for the task. And I want to tell you something. It's easy in our vantage point theologically to think of God as the judge as being basically bad news right? Because we're sinners, and we know that God has to judge sin. And so, you know, cue in gospel. But I'll tell you, there is another side to that in which that God being the supreme judge of the world is good because somebody must be the judge of the world. Somebody must have the authority to act on the pollution of sin in the world. We can't do it. We're not big enough. We don't have the authority. There is only one person who can judge hearts, the universal experience of complexity in personal matters, the awareness of nuances of all real things, it requires a judge who can look rightly upon the heart. Look at that language, right? God looks in and He can decide the, the way in which hearts are operating on the earth is only evil continually. Could I make that statement? I couldn't. I don't have access. I can't see. But He does and He can. There's only one who can do it. And ultimately, we want a God who is fit for the task of judging the world. We need a world that is called to account on matters of justice, matters of righteousness, right? Mikhail looked at me, and there was was no one to appeal to but to our Lord. Come on in, guys. And I will tell you, um, I, I needed that in that moment. I needed to appeal to the Lord in that way. So, we see God's response to sin is grief and necessary judgment. But isn't there more than that? What about the gospel? What about grace? Well, there is. Verse 8, it ends on a high note. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah, who we were introduced to last chapter as the one in whom the hopes of Lamech to reverse the curse, we're going to be pinned. Here he is. He comes up again. This time, Noah has found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God looks at Noah, and he sees a plan for how to keep the promised seed going and to bless the world. So, even in the midst of this darkness, God's grace is operative. God looks at Noah, and he breathes a sigh of relief. The floodwaters of judgment must fall and wipe out the pollution of sin, and they will fall. But Noah and his family will serve as a hard restart to the divine plan of creation. God will start again in Noah. So you ask, what does this mean for us, right? I ask this in a passage so strange. What does it mean for us? 
Well, it really means this. God's grief at sin is healed by the presence of His own grace. Think of that. God has the solution to the problem that He sees even within Himself. He doesn't have to go outside of Himself to find it. He looks at Noah and He says, I'll work there. I'll keep moving in Noah. In righteous Noah, God sees a way for His blessing to advance in the face of His own judgment. Later on, God will require a sacrifice from Abraham. You're familiar with this. He asks Abraham to sacrifice his firstborn son. But in the last moment, in that scene, God provides a ram caught in the thicket to spare this son. You'll see that pattern happening again and again. This is God's grace in action. As Christians, we are seeing God's heart on every page of Scripture increasingly. And day by day, we are seeing it on the pages of our own lives. God's heart beats for the flourishing of the world that He's made, for the people that He's made in His image, and for the things that make for peace. Therefore, God cannot look the other way on moral degradation. He can't. When all the world succumbs to moral degradation and self-interested violence and haughtiness of heart, God alone sits in perfect judgment. God looks at sin and He says, no further, no longer, no more. God's good heart must do justice even as His good heart shows mercy. It's in Jesus that God's justice is satisfied, right, in the sacrifice that He, that he endures. It is in Jesus that God's mercy flows freely to all in accordance with with His grace. That's what brings relief to God. That's what soothes His broken heart. And here's the question today. This is a question to me. I I wrote it to myself, but it's for you. Does that gospel, do those dynamics, does that soothe your heart? The complexity of that wrapped up into the simplicity of that gospel presentation Do you know that gospel? Have you trusted that grace? That's the question. We've seen the pattern and the pollution of sin that led the whole world into moral degradation. We saw the response, the dual response of divine grief and of grace. And our hearts are being prodded at. We're being called to hold on to holiness of heart today. I I think that, that if we're looking at God's heart and trying to adjust our heart to His, we can do it in in a few ways here in holding on to our own holiness before Him. I'll give you just three. If I'm looking at my heart, you're looking at yours, a holy heart hurts at sin. It really does. A holy heart hurts at sin. And I ask myself this question, what part of my heart is numb to the offense of sin? What part of my heart is? Because parts of my heart are. I gave myself this prayer, Lord, give me your heart to reject the impure, to reject the boastful, to reject the hateful thing, the thing that you would look at and be grieved by. Lord, I want to be grieved by it too, because I want my heart to look like yours. A holy heart will hurt at sin. But also a holy heart will hope in grace. Don't get stuck in one side of the equation. Move to the other as well. A holy heart hopes in grace. And here's my prayer to myself, my question, prayer from myself to God. Here's my question. What part of my heart is hopeless? Right? What part of it is hopeless? What part of my heart is hoping in something other than the arm of the Lord? Right? Remember that pattern of sin? It starts with looking away from God and then looking to created things and then acting upon them as substitutes, reaching out for them, taking them. Ultimately, they fail. A holy heart hurts at sin and hopes in God's grace. Because thirdly, a holy heart hangs on through suffering. Hangs on through suffering, through judgment and chastising. We'll get to it in the coming week or so, but Noah is going to hang on right? Noah's family is going to hang on. 
It's going to be smelly. It's going to be longer than He wants it to be, right? He's going to hang on through the judgment and the chastising of the world. And I have to ask this question, what chastisement is chiseling me further into the image of my suffering Savior? What is the judgment that's working in my life to make me look more like Jesus? A holy heart hurts at sin, hopes in grace, and hangs on through God's work in suffering. I want to do something different in ending this sermon. I'm going to read you guys a prayer uh, that, that I read throughout the week sometimes, but I think it really fit this week. This is a Puritan prayer. It's beautiful. The Puritans are great because they're good at getting at these dynamics. O God, may Thy Spirit speak in me that I may speak to Thee. I have no merit. Let the merit of Jesus stand for me. I am undeserving, but I look to Thy tender mercy. I am full of infirmities and wants and sin. But thou art full of grace. I confess my sin, my frequent sin, my willful sin. All my powers of body and soul are defiled. A fountain of pollution is deep within my nature. There are chambers of foul images within my being. I've gone from one odious room to another. I've walked in no man's land of dangerous imaginations. I have pried into the secrets of my fallen nature. I am utterly ashamed that I am what I am in myself. I have no green shoot in me, nor fruit, but thorns and thistles. I'm a fading leaf that the wind drives away. I live bare and a barren as a winter tree, unprofitable, fit to be hewn down and burnt. Lord, dost thou have mercy on me? Thou hast struck a heavy blow at my pride, at the false god of my own self, and I lie in pieces before thee, before you. But thou hast given me another master and Lord, thy son, Jesus. And now my heart is turned toward holiness. My life speeds as an arrow from a bow towards complete obedience to thee. Help me in all my doings to put down sin and to humble pride. Save me from the love of the world and the pride of life, from everything that is natural to a fallen man. And let Christ's nature be seen in me day by day. Grant me grace to bear thy will without repining, and delight to be not only chiseled, squared, or fashioned, but separated from the old rock where I have been embedded for so long, and lifted from the quarry to the upper air, where I may be built in Christ forever. Wow. These guys know how to pray. Well, puppies make a monstrous mess, and it's cute. But when we make the mess, it's less cute. It's less cute. When people do it, it grieves the heart of God, a heart that is motivated by justice as well as grace. First, this morning we saw the specific way in which moral degradation takes place in our lives and even takes hold in our society. But then we saw that dual response of divine grief and divine grace. And then we let those lessons sink in and percolate as we considered how we might hold on to holiness of heart. Let's pray. Father, we do reach out to You today from under the weight of, of a world that does sometimes feel polluted by sin, from hearts that do seem too heavy to be holy, and yet we know that Your heart lifts us up, that You have grace for us, that You grieve over the difficulties that we face within our world and without, that You have made a way for us to be in Your presence, that You are the one who provides the ram and the thicket. You are the one whose seed carries on through Noah. Your plan prospers and benefits us despite our sin. We love You, Lord. We trust You. This week, help us to walk more closely with You, to desire intimacy with You at deeper and deeper levels, to grow into Christ's likeness every day. 
We pray these things in the Spirit, by the name of Jesus. Amen.